I want to thank the organizers for arranging this very uh, interesting meeting. For my talk, I, 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 there's two topics that are going to be included. One is the bispectrum for the fluctuations in the number density of galaxies. And the other is the, the Im impact of the transformation to conformal Fermi coordinates. Two very different topics, but what they have in common is they're all done in the context of quasi-single field inflation. The work that I'm going to describe in the talk, you can find it in these two papers. And I want to give uh, most of the credit to my collaborators. As far as references go in this talk, I didn't want to scatter them out throughout the talk. So what I've done is just put out front some of the key references, original papers in the subject that, that, that the work done that I'm going to describe builds on. And it's really not even, uh, a com certainly not a complete list of those papers, but it contains the, the very earliest papers as far as I know. So here's the rest of the references. I'm going to start off by a little bit of review, and probably for this audience, the review is not necessary, but I think there's one or two points worth, worth making or emphasizing. So this is the standard picture for single field inflation. You have an infliton phi, you have some potential, you have the infliton field phi rolling down that potential. In this region here, the modes uh, of phi uh, that are of cosmological interest for observations cross the horizon. They get pushed out of the horizon. When you expand the field in modes, you expand using a fixed wave vector k, uh, but the physical wave vector k uh, is, the physical wave vector q is this k divided by a. So as a expands exponentially because V is approximately exponentially because V is so flat here. Q gets smaller and smaller or the wavelength gets larger and larger going from inside the horizon to outside the horizon. Of course, at later times after inflation, they then re-enter the horizon and impact uh, the things we observe. During inflation and standard slow roll inflation, the modes go to a constant as they cross, as they get pushed out of the horizon, and therefore uh, the power spectrum for fluctuations in the curvature goes like 1 over k cubed during the inflationary era. And that 1 over k cubed is really a, is, is a scale invariant spectrum. If we are interested in small k today, or small q today, uh, then what you do is you evaluate, uh, what we're interested in is not curvature, but actually fluctuations in the mass density in the matter-dominated era. And to this t naught is today, not during the inflationary era, so they've come back in the horizon. But still, we can look at low k or, or low uh, q today. And to go from curvature fluctuations to density perturbations, we have to put an extra factor of k squared because basically it's grad squared of this, that's, that's rho. And that has an important implication. This is one over kq, but if we're interested in the power spectrum for the, the, the density, matter density or energy density fluctuations today, what you get at low k is, uh, well, usually the convention is k is q today. So at, at at low k, you get a, a factor of k, it's a two-point function of the power spectrum, so you get a factor of k squared for each of the two uh, Fourier transforms of delta, and so you get k squared, k squared over k cubed, which is k, and that's the famous Harrison-Zeldovich spectrum. What we measure from the CMB, for example, is a power spectrum that goes like k to the ns, and ns is not one, it deviates significantly from one. It, the deviation is called the tilt. The tilt is small, uh, but nonetheless uh, significantly uh, not different from zero. And if we want to go more generally, not the, the smallest k, then there's another thing you put in here, t of k, that's called the transfer function. And it cuts off things at, at large k. So this is a standard slow roll inflation. And in quasi-single field inflation, we add another scalar field, s. And S doesn't participate really in the slow roll process. 
but uh, the coupling of phi to s can give rise to significant uh, uh, non-Gaussianities, which are the focus of my talk. So we're going to work on the limit of exact scale invariance. So we're going to neglect this uh, tilt. Before I go on, I have this very curious picture here that says there can be only one. And uh, there's, a, there's a guy there with a sword and the lightning bolt coming down. Maybe the person there is Steve Weinberg. And this is just a reminder that, you know, we're going to work in a model, quasi-single field inflation. We're going to adopt a paradigm, which is inflation. But in the end, there can be only one. There's only one model, and there's only one physics of the early universe. Maybe it's not inflation. Maybe it is inflation, but it's not, you know, quasi-single field inflation. But still, you know, this is, oh, we deal in our field with speculative physics, and we want to do that. We hope the things uh, that we work on will be the one, but it's important to, to be modest about that. And even if they don't end up being one, usually there's a lot of value, physical insight, things that you gain from exploring a particular model uh, or a particular paradigm. So what is quasi-single field inflation? So we got the inflaton field, and we're going to add an additional scalar field that I mentioned is S. And you now apart from the usual part of inflation that involves phi, the inflaton potential, et cetera, uh, this is the new term you add in addition to a Lagrangian just involving S. And uh, these are the terms you get. So oh, I should say, usually, you know, for the inflaton field phi, you can work in a gauge where it's just some function of time, phi naught of time. And we'll do that. And in particular, we'll, we'll take its time derivative to be a constant, independent of time. And so where do the fluctuations live then? Well, one introduces this Goldstone field that's usually called pi. And the curvature perturbations, zeta, are related to pi in terms of the Hubble constant and phi naught dot. And then you can write a Lagrangian using the rules developed for the effective field theory for inflation uh, that, it, that, that comes from this Lagrangian and comes for the Lagrangian from S. And here I've written it down here. There's uh, the type, the part that's quadratic in the field. And one important aspect of that is it involves a, a peculiar S pi mixing term. Uh, and the parameter mu here that enters in, it, it, it's just two phi naught dot over lambda. I think a lot of papers call mu rho. Uh, but it's, it's just a constant, because we're treating phi naught dot as constant. And what we're interested in is correlators of pi uh, in in correlators that will eventually translate into uh, into into the bispectrum of fluctuations in the number density of galaxies. Another correlator, but but a, of a, a thing that's more directly measurable. Well, the density fluctuations themselves, of course, are measurable. That's what you measure in the CMB aspects of it or put limits on. So we're going to calculate Feynman diagrams. We're going to calculate correlators of pi, then translate them to the things that we want to calculate. And particular limits will be of interest. So for example, if, we're, if we talk about uh, two point, well, three point and four point correlators of pi, uh, they play an important role in what we're going to do, and there's there's two limits that are important. If you if we're going to start off with a little review of the of how you get the power spectrum for the fluctuations in number density of galaxies, then we'll go on to the bi spectrum, and, and these are the ones that are important for the power spectrum. And you'll notice that they only involve three point vertices. So I'm oh, sorry, the dotted lines are pi, uh, and the solid lines are S. I've treated this mixing as if it was just an insertion here, but actually we resum to all orders in mu, so we just solve for the mode functions. But I think picturing it like this has some value. And 
and uh, it ends up that these two limits, the squeeze limit of the three-point function where these wave vectors are large, almost equal and opposite, and this wave vector is much smaller, and, uh, and similarly, the compressed limit of the four-point function where these vectors are almost equal and opposite and large, and there's a small wave vector Q that flows through this, that this diagram, those are the limits that will be of interest to us. It ends up that this quantity alpha minus plays an important role. Well, alpha plus and minus, they both play a role, but in particular alpha minus. And we're gonna deal with a situation where m squared plus mu squared is small compared to h squared. So you can expand this square root and these two terms cancel against each other. And so alpha minus will be, uh, will be much smaller than unity in the case we're interested in. Okay, so we're interested in galaxies in this talk, and I'm gonna start off, and we're actually interested in pretty large distances or small Qs around 100 H inverse megaparsecs or even larger. And, but we're interested really in galaxies. So first of all, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the fluctuations in the mass density, their Fourier transform, and I'm gonna average them over a radius R, some ball of radius R, and are supposed to be the scale that would collapse to a galaxy. So it's the scale that goes nonlinear to collapse to a galaxy. And if we have one particular realization of fluctuations, of course I've drawn it in one dimension, it's, it's on a slide, you can be forgiven for that, then it might look something like this, fluctuating about zero. And you can see that I've put dots here at the, at the peaks or, and, and if you ask, where's a galaxy gonna form? Well, it's probably not gonna form here, here, and here. These might be places that are voids. Maybe it forms here, 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 and here. Uh, maybe galaxies only form if the, if the peaks are above a certain threshold. It's, it's some very complicated dynamical function of the underlying density perturbations where you get a galaxy. We're, we're not gonna deal with a particular model for that in any detail in this talk. What I'm, what I, I'm just gonna do is make a, a simple expansion. And what, I'm gonna, what I, I'm gonna say for the purpose of this talk is that the fluctuations in the number density of galaxy that I call delta G here, it can just be expanded in this averaged uh, uh, delta rho over rho. So pretty crude, probably it involves derivatives, it's much more complicated, but I think this picture has a lot of value and really is not so far from, uh, from being realistic. So what we're interested then for the power spectrum, which is a two-point function, is the Fourier transform of the two-point correlation of this. And just to organize things to, so that we can expand and focus on certain Feynman diagrams, we're gonna have V triple prime over H much less than one. We actually, we have to because of the limits on FNL from uh, the cosmic microwave background. But the Feynman diagrams, they have certain enhancements that, are, that occur. For example, if I think of delta rho over rho, just going back, this diagram uh, in terms of pi from this line has a one over Q cubed before we get to delta rho, just fluctuations in pi, and it's got some correction from this, but let's just neglect this. It's actually more like q cubed uh, three minus alpha minus, but, uh, but let's just call it cubed. But the point is that when I, when I include the factors of, of k squared or q squared from the transition to density fluctuations here and here, it's a k squared, the large k. Here it's a q squared. And when I put this in the bias expansion, oh, a similar thing happens here. Here it's, uh, it's k1 squared, k1 squared, k2 squared, k2 squared, and you just get a one over k, one over q cubed for this line. But then because of this bias expansion, when I put them together and calculate a two point function of delta g, for example, there's a term that goes like b2, B1, and so you get these k squares in this loop in terms of the way particle physicists think about it. And then this line, you get the q squared over q to the 
Q, roughly Q cubed for small, uh, this is really alpha minus. And so this has a one over Q compared to the term that goes like B1 squared, which as we mentioned before, would just go like Q. And so where the poor point function gives you something that goes like one over Q cubed. It's not that this is necessarily more important than this as Q gets small in the region we're interested in because this has an extra factor of V triple prime. And so with this power counting, they're both comparable actually. So as I mentioned before, uh, you know, I'm just focusing on V triple prime, imagining all the other terms in the potential are small. I'm actually taking the part of the interaction Lagrangian that just comes from V, not the other parts. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, particular things that we're doing here. But in, in that context, that's, this is what dominates. The other parts that come from uh, the dimension five operator, they, they act, their contribution to the non-Gaussianity is smaller. So one important feature of these one over these enhancements is that gravitational evolution, which also causes non-Gaussianities, can't give rise to these enhancements. So they're really something that's purely from, uh, from primordial non-Gaussianity. And of course, if they're big and cause a rise in the power spectrum, they help with the observation of primordial non-Gaussianity uh, from uh, survey, galactic surveys. Just one more word about non-Gaussianity before I move on. The talk is focused on these enhancements, but of course, any observation of non-Gaussianity is, uh, is extremely important. It would be the signal of new, uh, new degrees of freedom relevant for inflation. It would be really a revolution in the subject. But these enhancements are the topic of my talk. So on to the bispectrum, which is really the, the main thing I wanted to talk about. So of course, even if the primordial fluctuations are Gaussian, if the galaxies you know, are biased with a bias expansion, then you get a, you get a, a bispectrum uh, for, for the galactic number density. And the, you know, there's a term that goes, for example, like B1 squared B2 times Q1 Q2 be the leading contribution. And then you'd have to add to this uh, gravitational nonlinearities, unless you went to very uh, small Q, in which case this also gets small. So that's always there. And uh, now we want to talk about the non-Gaussianities that are generated primordially and translate them into the bispectrum Fourier transform of the three-point function for fluctuations in the number density of galaxies after, of course, you take out the, uh, the delta function that tells you that th these three wave vectors have to sum to zero. So there's not all independent. Okay, so in the power counting I mentioned before that I have out here, I've written for you, out for you all the Feynman diagrams that you need to compute. And we're going to be interested in the situation where all three wave vectors are small. And let's just look at these diagrams. We should be comparing them in some sense with this, how they go with Q. So I'm just going to do one of them. You could look in our paper if you want to see the rest of them. And so let's do this one here. So these are large Ks, large Ks in magnitude, large Ks in magnitude, almost equal and opposite. Uh, so, uh, so the small Q flows through these lines here. And of course, when we calculate, this is gonna give us a contribution that goes like, like B2 cubed. And when we sew it all together, here it is using the same sort of pictures I use for the two point function. And here I've written out what goes in here, of course, is a six point function in the particular limit where the Q's here are small compared to the K's. And here I've written out what you get in quasi single field inflation, the limit of small mu and M, where it comes from the V triple prime piece, what you get. And you notice that it has a one over Q uh, to the sixth. Doesn't really matter which Q it is here because it raised to the very small power alpha minus. So uh, 
so we get a one over Q to, to, to the sixth and, uh, and the, the factors of the K squared and the transfer function, they all go in these loops here. So this is gonna give us a contribution to the bispectrum for galaxies that will go like one over Q cubed, where I'm treating Q1, Q2, and Q3 as of order Q. So a very dramatic enhancement. So now there should be a plot. And there is a plot in our paper, but there's a problem with the plot. And that's that these enhancements in this model, given the limit on FNL, they don't become important till cues that correspond to length scales that are of order or around, more than order, around uh, 200 H inverse megaparsecs, 100 H inverse megaparsecs. And the power spectrum is already measured out to uh, you know, something like 100 H inverse megaparsecs, but I think it'll be a long time before the bispectrum is measured there. So I didn't put the plot in. You can find it in, in our paper that was referenced at the beginning of the talk. Maybe there's other models where these things can become important at 50 H inverse megaparsecs. This is a, you know, this is a business where factors of two matter. Of course, we're used to it all the time in physics, right? The world, at least the history of physics would be very different if the Z boson weighed the 10 GeV versus uh, 100 GeV, even though they're almost the same order of magnitude, those two numbers, only differ by one order of magnitude. So that's all I want to say about the bispectrum for galaxies. The particular power counting, what diagrams contribute might vary from model to model, but uh, this sort of sets up a way to do that and look at such things. Unfortunately, if, you know, if you're computationally weak like me, if you have to calculate a six point function, there's a significant amount of pain that's induced. So now a change of topics. I want to talk about the transformation to conformal Fermi coordinates. And now I'm going to do the exact opposite in some sense. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm going to focus on the interactions from this part, neglecting this, this part. And so that's what we're going to do. And the reason I'm going to do that is because it's really that, it's really that part that where the transformation can matter, especially if we're dealing, can be significant, especially if we're dealing with uh, the situation where we have scale invariance. So if you have scale invariance and the way the change to conformal Fermi coordinates can matter, it can affect, what it does is it affects the bispectrum that you measure uh, in the squeeze limit, very small Q. Uh, here I've, so this is the change that you get uh, to the bi-spectrum, and it involves derivatives with respect to time of the power spectrum evaluated, let's say, uh, at the end of inflation. And usually this is approximately zero because the modes don't continue to, er to evolve outside the horizon. But in quasi-single field inflation, with a very small m squared plus mu squared over h squared, so alpha minus is small. If you look at the pi field, these are, I just, there's two modes of the pi field, because uh, you have pi and s and they mix, so you basically have two uh, mode functions and two mode functions for s. I haven't written them down for s, and eta is, of, co is of course, k tau. So if alpha minus is very small, this is still approximately evolving. And so we can still get something from the transformation to the change of coordinates. And what I want to do is compare that to uh, the contribution that you usually calculate from what's called, what you would call, uh, what's called in the literature, the global coordinates. So that's what we're going to do. And as I said before, we're going to uh, treat m squared plus mu squared over h squared is very small. So you might worry if the modes are still evolving somewhat all the way to the end of inflation, you might think that other physics maybe related to reheating would play a big role and that could be right. But what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to just neglect all those things. We're going to treat h and phi naught dot as constants all the way to the end of inflation 
we're going to have scale invariance. Uh, scale invariance means something a little different when you still have time dependence because if you think of the metric, if you scale x, if you want it to be an invariance of the metric, you've got to also scale tau, so x and tau scale the same way because uh, you have a 1 over a squared tau squared. And then k scales the opposite way for x because the Fourier transform, and so k tau is also scale invariant, so you can, you can have dependence on tau bar through k tau bar. Are. So I'm not going to go through the calculations. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's a little bit novel. You got to keep the time dependence, but still it's the same method. What instead I'll do to save some time is just show you some plots. So, oh, there's one equation I do want to show you, which is the power spectrum at finite time in this model with the assumptions I made. And it's power spectrum for the curvature, and I, did, I didn't call this K, I called it P, because I stole it from our paper, uh, the LaTeX. So the P dependence in here, it gives rise to some tilt. And remember, I'm working where the rest is scale invariant, so this is basically the only tilt in the way I'm imagining doing the computation. And so you can compare the tilt you get from this from, with, uh, with the experimental value. And it's not exactly the same functional form, but you know, you can take P cubed, uh, time, little p cubed, magnitude times this big P, and then take D by DP of that, and then divide by P cubed times P, you get a tilt, and then you can do, do it for this. Okay, you can make that comparison. And this is just two values of the time at the end of inflation, and, uh, and it forces you to lie in these regions of small alpha minus. And here I've plotted FNL, uh, the various contributions, the global coordinates here, uh, the change from the transformation to conformal Fermi coordinates, and this is the sum. So you can see that it matters a lot to, to make this transformation, which is really why I think this, this model is interesting. Most of the constants cancel out when you calculate the non-Gaussianity. So you basically just get a prediction for FNL in terms of alpha minus. And unfortunately, it's quite small, which is why people usually look at the potential part for S when they talk about non-Gaussianities in this model. But physics, including cosmology, is it, you play the long game. So maybe sometime far in the future, even FNLs at this level will be reachable. I think for the immediate future, we're talking about FNLs, uh, reaching FNLs that are somewhat less than unity is certainly a, a practical thing to, to, to happen with the, the new large galactic surveys. So what's interesting about this, I think, is it's an example where the change of coordinates doesn't exactly cancel out the fluctuations in the squeeze limit the way it does for single field inflation. Uh, very famous result, but here it just gives a contribution of the same order. So I don't think it's particular, su particularly surprising that it does this, but it is a nice example of, uh, of that occurring. Well, that's the end of my talk. I just want to say one or two words to wrap things up, and that's that it really is a very exciting time in cosmology. We'll have these, these new galactic surveys to probe the non-Gaussianity, uh, we're going to start uh, things like CMBS4, not the observations, but construction, and uh, well, it's still a ways away, but it's not so far away uh, for the gravity waves, which is an extremely interesting part of inflation. And also just, you know, the we're going to learn a lot about the, the, the new light degrees of freedom from measurements uh, happening now and upcoming just from the expansion of the universe and how that impacts things like uh, clustering. So it's a really exciting time and uh, I'm honored to be able to participate uh, in, this, in this subject. Thank you.